Hi, my name is Barbie Enrico, and I'm here to welcome you to Pitch Tips Zoomcast, and where venture capitalist Fred Haney gives feedback to CEOs of startup companies to help them raise capital. Fred is an experienced venture capital fund manager, angel investor, entrepreneur, founder of Monday Club, and author of The Fundable Startup, one of the best-selling books about startup companies getting funded. So let's find out what Fred has to say to today's CEO. Hi, and welcome to the Pitch Tips Zoomcast. Um, I'm Fred Haney, your host, and the idea here usually is that we uh, listen to the pitch of a CEO of a startup company who's trying to raise capital. And the idea is the CEO is pitching to me, the experienced venture capitalist, uh, and my purpose is to help him tune up the message, uh, improve his chances of getting funded. Uh, and it's an opportunity for you, the audience, to be a fly on the wall and watch the dynamic between an entrepreneur and a seasoned investor. I say seasoned investor, I've been around hundreds of startup companies uh, as a venture capital fund manager, a large company, corporate strategic planning executive, a founder of Tech Coast Angels, which is one of the largest angel investment uh, groups in the country. Um, I've done a lot of deals on my own as an angel. I've also been a co-founder of half a dozen companies myself. So I, I've seen startups from lots of different angles uh, and rarely see a situation that I haven't experienced before. And, and through all that, I've also had about 60 exits if you add up the venture capital plus my personal exits. We're here today with Allison Byers, who is the CEO of Scrubius. I hope I said that right. Uh, you, and, you did. Uh, it's a funny name. <laughs> Allison, welcome to the show. So today's going to be a little different. Uh, instead of interviewing uh, the CEO of a startup company, we're going to have a conversation with Allison about um, how you build a good pitch deck. Allison is in the business of helping companies prepare uh, their pitch deck. So she's just the perfect person for us to talk to. And the whole idea of today's program will be uh, to uh, explore some of the different issues related to how you create a pitch deck. Allison, why don't you take a second and uh, tell us a little about yourself, about your background, how you got involved with Scrubius, and a little bit about what Scrubius does. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited for this conversation. Love talking about pitches. <laughs> so, um, pitching pitches. Exactly. Uh, so I was a tech operator for a long time. Uh, I have been for quite a while. Uh, and I founded this current company, Scrubius, two years ago. The impetus for founding this, and then I'll get more into what we do, uh, was my experience beforehand where I launched and ran a medical device company that was spun out of MIT. I'm in the Boston area. Uh, and I was the business person on the team. I did our fundraising and raised about 10 million over the course of five years while we were there before we were acquired. Uh, so it went from a uh, friends and family through a series A prime. Uh, and for me, what was really defining about the experience was uh, one, the inefficiency of the fundraising process itself, which was my first time leading that. Uh, and then two, the gender bias that I experienced. Uh, it was uh, really overt bias in a way that I had not experienced previously in my career, even though I'm quite comfortable being the only woman in the room by nature of uh, what I do. So I spent a long time researching the space of fundraising and pitching, understanding uh, whether my experience was typical. And you very quickly come across some pretty devastating statistics, like only 2% of VC dollars going to women, 0.67% uh, going to Black women, which means it is almost statistically impossible to raise venture money if you are a woman of color. Uh, and I really wanted to build a company that would do something meaningful in the space to help get capital into the hands of these overlooked founders who have very investable ideas. Uh, and it came through in my research that for founders who have been traditionally blocked from investor networks, it is not intuitive and it's very difficult to understand the investor mindset so that you can create pitch material that will be compelling to an investor and will have you taken seriously. Uh, and with Scrubius, 
we have essentially productized what you would get from working with a pitch coach uh, so that we can make this type of education and feedback on pitch material very accessible and very affordable. Uh, and we do work with all kinds of founders. We've worked with over 300 founders since we launched our MVP last year. Uh, but we do focus on those who identify as underrepresented and we pro provide a lot of content to them in understanding uh, how you approach fundraising, how investors think and how you can uh, produce the signals that they're looking for in both your pitch material and in how you present it. So I'm gonna, we, we do some work on the investor side too, but for the purposes of today's conversation, I think we'll we'll leave it there. Oh, that, that's good. And, and uh, I, I do think you'd find that uh, my book, The Fundable Startup would uh, help you with some perspective on that. Uh, I, I'm not gonna get into the debate about uh, 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 underrepresented people, but when I get into that conversation, I have done some blog posts on that subject um, I'm, I'm quick to remind people that most, at least the venture capital investors, are looking for CEOs who have a very good chance of getting the job done. In most cases, they're looking for CEOs who have some experience. So when someone says only 2% of women get funded, uh, you have to put that in context. And the context there is that 5% of CEOs are women. So if, if the venture capitalists have a bunch of business plans on their desk and one is from a, a really experienced and successful CEO, that's probably where they're gonna, gonna lean. Can that be overcome? Yes, but um, it, it takes two puzzle pieces to get the attention, at least of the top venture capital funds. One is a really good idea, you know, a, 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 a blockbuster idea. And the other is compelling management. So there's a context there. I like what you're doing. I think you're doing a, a great thing. And a lot of people do need a lot of help. Uh, but it's not always possible to take someone who doesn't have much CEO experience and turn them into uh, a fundable CEO. I mean, the, the, most CEOs, experienced CEOs have 15 or 20 years of experience operating as CEOs. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's context around what stage of deal the venture capital firm is focused on, what's their thesis. There's a big difference between pre-seed and seed stage companies and series B or later companies in terms of the progression of that CEO or, or where they've been in the funding they've achieved before. Uh, when we look at earlier stages, I would argue that that ratio is not 5%. Uh, and anything that is 2% uh, is a, indicative well, of a systemic issue. Yeah, it's, right? it's, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's small numbers. Um, so let's uh, jump in at the beginning. I, I, in your mind, what, what's the purpose of a startup company pitch deck? What, what uh, uh, purpose or purposes uh, is it intended to serve? Yeah, so with a pitch deck, uh, it's in, it has different purposes depending on what the goal of the meeting is. But if we're talking about kind of the introductory pitch, your first pitch deck, your goal is to convince an investor that you are worth more time. So that pitch deck has to effectively convey the opportunity that you're presenting uh, and hit on the points that investors need to understand to evaluate if it is worth more time for their fund or if it's an angel for that individual to consider investment in your company. Uh, so it's an overall introduction, but it also has to contain, you know, meat behind it and data that is compelling and convincing, uh, as well as some of the mechanics about how you're going to execute your idea so that you can continue to get more time with that investor and hopefully lead toward due diligence. Um, but I, there is, I think, a trap founders fall into thinking the point of a pitch deck is to get a check which is almost never the case. It, it's a much longer process. I think that's a, that's a really good way to think about it. I, w one comment I would make is that I, I think a pitch deck can serve another purpose. And this is 
a, a bit of a pet peeve for me. Um, I get a lot of pitch decks in the mail, email, uh, where the purpose is to get that first meeting. You know, it's people sending me a pitch deck because they want to pitch to my Monday Club group, which are in the business of helping companies tighten up their pitch, or, or they want to do a, a pitch tip Zoomcast. So they're sending me a pitch deck and basically saying, I want to get on your calendar. I want to have that first meeting. And I see an awful lot of pitch decks that were, they're probably okay if the CEO is standing there beside the slides explaining them. But a lot of them are just all full of graphics. And I just throw my hands up in the air and say, uh, I, I don't have a clue what this business is about. So I, how do you get that first meeting? Yeah, no, I completely agree. There is, we talk about this a lot with our founders. There is a happy medium where you have to have a deck that is substantial enough that somebody can understand it if they don't have you talking next to it, they don't have your narrative but isn't like sending a book to someone, right? Where there's so much text that an investor just can't take the time. Uh, so the way that we coach our founders to make your deck really readable and understandable quickly, whether it's sending it ahead to get that meeting or if you're presenting it, uh, is one to utilize header statements on every slide. So every slide should have one major point to it. The, the so what of this slide. If someone remembered one thing, what do you want it to be? And you write that at the top. It tells me the point of it. And if you lined up all those headers, it should kind of make sense to read through that narrative of your deck, right? Everything under that header is supporting it and it's more information. But if you have those headers, it transforms your deck and it makes it so easy for an investor who's getting it, you know, maybe via email to determine whether it's worth the first meeting to just tell yeah. them. <laughs> I, I, I love what you're saying. I think it's a really good approach. I, I've used the word instead of headers, I like to use the word headlines. And the reason is that a, a headline in my mind uh, is more of an active statement. Uh, you know, a header can be marketing. But, but a headline is, um, here's how we're going to go about marketing this company. So, but that idea, that concept of uh, building something in the middle that uh, it works fine as a present, in a presentation situation, but it also contains enough information um, to uh, uh, get somebody's attention if you're not there to make the pitch. I have a, a, on my uh, fredhaney.com, if you uh, go down on the homepage, uh, there's a template that I've used for years for putting pitch decks together. It's titled uh, How to Answer Investors' Questions. And the, the focus is on the questions that are really important to investors. But I have really have always felt that with some uh, uh, cryptic bullets, um, and your head, head headers or headlines that you can create a pitch deck that has content, um, but it also doesn't, what, what you don't want is a lot of text that people have to read when you're in the room presenting. Uh, so I, I think you, there, there are ways to find that middle ground. And I think that's exactly the right way to think about it. Yeah, it, it, exactly right. It, it's, I, you know, founders, I think sometimes don't realize that if someone is interested in your deck, they're going to pass it along. And so it becomes very messy if you start having a presentation only version or a send ahead only version where you've got a lot of text versus just graphics. And then you have to maintain both files if you want to make changes. It's so much easier for everyone to have that one middle ground version that you can use regardless of, of uh, you know, utilization. And so you can forward it and other people can be able to understand the deck without having been in the room. I think that's a really great way to think about it. It seems like I mean, this whole business has really evolved. I mean, I've been involved with it for probably 50 years. I mean, there was a time when everybody sat down and wrote a 35 page uh, business plan. <laughs> I, I remember that time. <laughs> and, and then, uh, I think PowerPoint really changed our lives. I mean, that that made it easier to make these uh, 
nice graphic presentations. But somewhere in the last five or 10 years, I think uh, more consultants and outside advisors have moved toward a really heavy use of graphics. Uh, and it drives me nuts sometimes because I, I get presentations that are kind of all graphics and the graphics don't say anything to me. Um, I guess my, my mantra about that is sometimes a word is worth a thousand pictures. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, there's a, I don't believe that founders should put graphics in their deck that aren't somehow bolstering the information they're getting across so they're not informative or if they aren't pictures of their product or of their solution because we see the same thing decks that are just full of stock photography or generic graphics that you know founders think look really snazzy or something but they're not conveying information and then your eye the investor's eye is drawn toward those graphics that aren't conveying anything and they're just taking up slide space and for the investor who's seeing, you know, a hundred decks a week, they need to as quickly as possible understand the content on that slide. So don't put anything on there that isn't conveying information. Well, th this isn't really a trick question. <laughs> it's probably just a hard question. Well, what's the essential message that an investor wants to get out of a pitch deck? I mean, if there's one thing that an investor is looking for, what, what do you think that is? So that is a that is a very much an it depends question based on context and a whole other lot of factors. But what I would say uh, is the most important lens to look through is that of risk reduction. An investor is looking through a deck trying to remove risk that this opportunity is going to work and that they're going to be able to earn, you know, a return on their investment. So every doesn't matter what section, what element of your deck, each of them carries a risk with it. And the investor is looking to take that risk away or mitigate that risk with the information on the slide. I, I, you said it really well. I think that's a good way to think about sort of both sides of the equation. Um, in the Pitch Tips Zoomcast, I usually start out by explaining that uh, an investor's mindset is actually pretty negative uh, when you're pitching to them. Uh, and there's a reason for it. I, I learned when I first got into the venture capital business um, that if I got all excited about all the businesses I saw, I was never gonna get anything done. I mean, I, I would see something, I'd like it, I'd do a lot of diligence, I'd learn a lot about the people, I'd spend days and hours and weeks, maybe months uh, digging into it. Um, but then if you end up saying no, you've wasted a lot of time. So the, the, the investors uh, have a terrible time management challenge. Uh, they've got 50 business plans on their desk. They've got 50 people trying to get on their calendar, 50 people trying to send them emails and text messages and phone calls. Uh, and the only way you can really manage all that is if you're going to say no, you say no fast. So I used to say to my team at 3i Ventures, look, our goal here is to spend all of our time on the deals we do and none of our time on the deals that we don't do. So that forces you to identify the showstoppers right away. Uh, I mean, that's how investors have to think about it. You know, what are the 10 things that could cause this company to fail? Uh, and how do we work around them? How do I get past them? Uh, is there an answer? Can I get comfortable with it? Or, or do we just end up saying no? The, the other half of it, and, and you mentioned this uh, in, a, in a really good way, is investors sitting there, risk reduction is a really good way to think about it. I mean, that, I think that's, that's key. Uh, the other thing is, can I make a return on investment? And I think it's important to sort of, for, for a, people who are putting a deck together to um, keep in mind what return on investment is. I mean, it, 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 if you do a little equation, I, I, I built the equation on my uh, template. Uh, it's basically uh, uh, the profits divided by the investment, profits over time. So you can keep getting into more detail. It's cash flows over some period of time divided by the investment over some period of time that's going to be required. Um, and so you really have to explain to me 
where those profits are coming from, why I should believe they're real, why do I believe there's a market, customers will buy, they'll pay the price, uh, you can deliver, um, uh, and, and also convince me that it can be done for the investment dollars you're talking about and help me understand what future investment dollars might be required. It's amazing how many pitch decks don't really address those questions. Yeah, yeah, it, it's true. And then, you know, an element underlying all of that, it's the convincing part. There's a lot of entrepreneurs who will just kind of like, you know, Google successful pitch decks or try to emulate Airbnb's pitch deck or something, but they, they make these grandiose statements and then they don't do the part where you go find the data that supports it and put it on the slide so that it is convincing. Because if you don't have that information and if you can't back it up with something real, you're just asking the investor to take your word for it. And that's not nearly as convincing as having facts and you know having done the research behind it, which a lot of people do have and they just don't put it in the, in the deck. Uh, and that's required, right? Or, or doing a bottom-up market size that is essential to do, not just the top-down, you know, we've got billions of spend in the industry that's not your revenue opportunity. And, and that's what goes into an equation of figuring out if you can get a return is your revenue opportunity and the profit opportunity, not just spend in a category. Yeah, I, there's a huge difference that uh, people need to understand between claims and supported claims. And, and um, I, I see a lot of business plans that are just full of claims. You know, we're, we're gonna we're gonna do the, we're gonna be the best, um, and and uh, we're gonna be better. And, and yeah, one thing just I'm say no to superlatives. <laughs> and I'm constantly asking, uh, how do you define better? How do you measure better? How do you know you're better? What does the customer think is better? How much better do you have to be to get the customer to make a purchase? Yeah, no, ex exactly right. Um, we have a particular eye toward it because my, my last company, we were regulated by FDA and you cannot make unsubstantiated claims. Uh, and and you, you, you must, you cannot make superlative claims. You can't do any of that. Um, but really it's a learning to carry with you when you're pitching investors because they see, everyone says they're the best. Everyone says they're the first. Everyone, you know, says these things. They see it over and over again. And it and it's just a trope. It doesn't really mean anything. And it's so much more convincing if you make one of those like a headliner statement that has a number in it that supports the statement. And then you have cited sources uh, and things that substantiate that statement that you are making that helps you, you know, be convincing that you can do what you say you're going to do. One, I, I, I've, I've learned that there are just a lot of little clues that tell me whether a pitch deck was put together by someone who really understands investors and how to pitch to investors uh, versus someone who probably doesn't. Uh, and the, the latter, I mean, the, the, some of the most obvious ones I see in the latter case are, are well, we have no competition. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the, the other one that just drives me crazy and you sort of alluded to it a, a little, uh, is, uh, well, we only need 1% of this billion dollar market to uh, be a successful company. Um, how do you deal with that? I mean, we, we recommend against saying anything like that, right? That, that's what's considered kind of the top down approach to your market size, which is there's, there's you know, billions of dollars spent in this industry. If we get 1%, this is our opportunity. But there's so much in that spend that has nothing to do with what you're selling or what you can capture. So it's just not really credible. It's not specific to your business. It might be good industry context if you want to show the growth of an industry and trends. But at the end of the day, the investor needs to know your revenue opportunity based on your business model, because that helps define the size of your market. Uh, and so we really push founders toward creating that bottom-up approach, which can, can be challenging. It can seem scary, but it's not. I, I, there, you know, if someone teaches you how to do it, it's a pretty simple framework for figuring that out. Uh, and then the entrepreneur is giving off such stronger signals of competence if you really can speak to that in a knowledgeable way. What I uh, asked 
CEOs to do is show me the market uh, where you're going to have a 20 or 30 percent market share. You know, define that when somebody says they're going to be one percent of a billion dollar market. Usually, the problem is they just haven't uh, narrowed the market definition down enough. They haven't right. really got down to a market that they can, in fact, serve, or the, a market that's sort of a reasonable facsimile to what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, um, and, and, that and puts I in a different, little different uh, category. Because I and and I mean the history. There's a lot of data that shows that. Uh, profitable companies uh, are usually have fairly substantial market share with, within their uh, industry, but it can be narrowly defined. Exactly. It totally, it depends on how you're defining that industry. And, you know, to your point about saying, well, we have no competition. Everyone has competition. Uh, and that that's a negative signal, like, like you said, to share with investors. And I think there is a misunderstanding where some entrepreneurs feel like that's a benefit to say that, that that's a positive signal, but competition means you have a substantiated market, that there is a need and people are looking for a solution. So having some competition is not a bad thing. Uh, and then in that market size, you know, again, as you were talking about, there's math behind that where it has to be a big enough market to support both you and competition. Right. Even if you truly believe you have no competition, which investors would never believe, uh, if you have a real thing, competition will enter the market and it still has to be big enough to support you. That you share kind of that 20 to 30 percent benchmark, because I, that's a good way to think about uh, when you talk about your TAM, your bottom up uh, total available market, how what piece of that you should be owning. Yep. Uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, but in the fundable startup, I made a whole list of uh, th these funny little clues that uh, uh, the, the person who's pitching hasn't done this very much. <laughs> the difference between an experienced CEO and an inexperienced uh, CEO. Um, and uh, the, the inexperienced one that's probably telling me we have no competition, we only need 1% market share, uh, our team is the best. Um, how, how do you uh, uh, pitch a team? How, how does it, uh, one of the things that, um, well, let me back up a little bit. Um, I told you my template uh, is titled how to answer investors questions. And, and there are two examples that uh, I, I think are strong examples of how people kind of miss the point a lot of the time about what's the real question. Uh, with respect to competition, I'm always seeing these little matrices that, that say, well, here's our company and we check all these boxes and here are the other companies and they check all these boxes. Uh, and, and my comment is uh, the question is not um, who are the other companies and which boxes do they check? The question is, what's the competitive dynamic within your industry? Who are the players? Uh, what's the basis for competition? How do customers decide uh, to buy? Is it price, performance, a thousand other things? You know, how does competition work? And what is your strategy for establishing a sustainable competitive position within that industry. So these companies that send me the little matrix just never answer that question. The other question, and, and I'll shut up in a minute, <laughs> the other question that uh, I, I have trouble with is uh, the team. The team is not uh, show me eight photographs and tell me what companies they've worked for. That doesn't answer my question about the team. The, the venture capitalist question about the team is, who are the players and why should I believe that they are the right people to make this company successful at this time? You know, Because remember, I got 50 pitch decks on my desk and some of them have teams that have done it before. They're, they're experienced and you're competing. This is something I think, Com startups often don't understand that they're competing against startups that have really good ideas and in some cases really good experience management teams. So how do, how do we get to the right answers there? Yeah, 
Yeah, so with team, uh, you know, you're mitigating risk of execution, right? So that's where it becomes important to know why this team member is the right one to be working with you and to be in the role that they're in based on the expertise or experience that they bring or on your previous work experience together. Uh, you know, I think, again, depending on stage of company, there's different levels of importance on different aspects of that. If we're talking about an early stage company, founder market fit becomes much more important to convey that you founding team members, you understand, you can put yourself in the mindset of your customer and you will be able to go to market and launch this company because you get them and you have relevant uh, experience in being able to execute on all the things you just told me you're going to do. If you're a later stage company, right, you'll have a bigger team, you'll have some data behind you, you'll be in growth mode, and it's not as important that the founding, you know, the top management team directly comes from experiencing the problem or the issue, uh, and more about that level of experience at that stage of company, or at least having recruited people who have that experience to be with you. So in terms of the deck itself, I think it does help to have some pictures. You can see some faces and, and see who people are. Uh, but then also to have just those a few bullets or a short little chunk of text that speaks to the most important elements of what you have done that make you the right person for this role, uh, as well as logos of where you have been. You, I mean, I think you would agree, investors do like to see logos of past companies where somebody has been. Um, but then when you look at that slide as a whole, it should be clear the complementary roles that the team is, are playing and that there isn't overlap so that you have a bunch of people with the same skill set in just different positions in the company, that that's a bad signal. Uh, and that, you know, the founder understands their own skill gaps and has recruited the right folks to come fill those in so you function as a real team. Yeah, I think one of the things that some founders sort of underestimate uh, is the value of their previous uh, experience. What one of the, uh, case studies in the fundable startup uh, that I wrote, uh, and I'm proud of having written it in like 2015, I think. Um, and it was about uh, Lori Torres, who was the uh, founder of a company called Parcel Pending. They were making these uh, uh, storage kiosks, parcel storage kiosks that would go into uh, the uh, main front office of a big apartment building so that in store, instead of UPS and FedEx just throwing packages into the front of the apartment building, they would put them into the kiosk and the kiosk would notify uh, the, the resident uh, that they have a package and give them a, a, a passcode to retrieve it. Um, and Lori had that idea probably before 2015, but I interviewed her in about 2015. And I wrote about her in the fundable startup uh, that she was uh, a startup founder. She didn't have any previous CEO experience, but she had a lot of good management experience. She, she had uh, managed the residential department business for the Irvine company for a number of years. And she'd done a lot of hiring and firing and team building and motivating and those kinds of things. And for that reason, um, I, I said that I thought she had a very good chance of being successful. My book was published in 2018. In about 2021, she sold her company for over 100 million bucks. Uh, and it, it really was a, a highly successful situation. Um, so I think there's an issue about how you pitch your management experience. And in the, in the course of doing these pitch tips uh, programs, uh, every once in a while, fairly frequently, uh, I have the experience with people where they, they show me the team, they give me a picture, they show me a couple corporate logos. And I say, well, wait a minute, explain to me what you did. And I had one just the last couple of weeks. The guy said, well, I managed an organization of 400 people and we accomplished this and accomplished. I said, tell me that. 
you know, that's so important. Uh, you know, it's so much more important than just putting a logo up there of who you work for. So I, I think a lot of times people sort of underestimate uh, the value of that, uh, the management experience and the, the interaction they've had with other people and other teams. So somehow they need to get that out front and center so it, it uh, sells itself. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's the whole understanding the investor mindset and, and what they need to know, right? So it's pulling out in those bullets the key elements of your career or your skill set that show the relevance and, again, remove the risk that you'll be able to manage growing this company and execute in the way that you need to as a uh, chief executive officer, which is why, you know, for that role, management experience is so crucial where, you know, it obviously may, might not be in, in other uh, management roles. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, I mean, the, my message in the fundable startup is really two components to a fundable company, the fundable idea and a fundable management. Team. Problem is to convince investors that, uh, that, that both are, are uh, truly fundable. Um, Let's see, uh, what, about, what should I have asked you <laughs> that I didn't, Allison? Um, well, so there's some other big topics that, um, you know, I tend to talk about what, I mean, we didn't cover presentation style, which is also yeah. a, its whole own topic, uh, you know, outside of just the material that you're sending. How do you, how do you present yourself? Um, because hopefully your pitch does include you, you hopefully you get the meeting uh, and then, you know, the other um, element that I talk about a lot, and this is, you know, I, I work with early stage founders who identify as underrepresented, is understanding the dynamic between founder and investor. Uh, and for founders, you know, a, a lot of the material that's out is what we've been talking about, is convincing an investor that, of something, that you are worth something. Um, but it's also important to understand that investors, their business model, relies on investing in companies and you are presenting an opportunity to invest in your company and not every investor is the right investor or not every investor will appreciate the opportunity that you're presenting for whatever reason. And so getting those fast no's is not always a bad thing. And I, you know, it's helpful for founders to realize it's actually a good, it's a really good thing to get a fast no. It means that investor appreciates the value of time on both sides. And you should move on and do some more work to find those investors who will be a better fit or maybe who will, you know, get it, will get what you're doing uh, or will you'll, you'll fit into their thesis more rather than try to talk to every single investor who will answer your call. Well, one of the, problems that uh, companies have, and I, I, I sort of sympathize, I feel sorry for them on this score, is that uh, I, I think investors often don't really, they're not honest about why they're declining to invest. They, they don't really, and, if and, and an awful lot of the time, the real answer is um, we don't have a lot of confidence in the team. Uh, or it just seems awfully, but what they'll say is it seems awfully early for us, come back when you've uh, uh, marched it uh, a little farther along. Uh, I hear there's a doggy in your life. Yes, I'm sorry, the doorbell rang, so we got, got a little woof, yeah. <laughs> there's a doggy in mine too, but hopefully he stays pretty quiet. Uh, um, but but you, you don't always know the real reason when investors decline. And, and it, it is important. I don't know that you can ever really penetrate that, but it's probably important to understand that and try and figure that out. Another uh, case study I did in the fundable startup was uh, dynamic reconfigurable computing. Um, I was involved with a company in its first iteration uh, and the very brilliant scientific founder insisted on being the CEO. And the VCs just kept saying too early, too early, too early, too early. Um, so I, it, it crashed after when the dot-com bubble burst. Uh, and I went to him and said, look, I think we can build a company here, but you're going to have to bring in an experienced CEO. He said, fine, we'll do what we need to do. So we did bring in a guy who had been the chief operating officer for Tandem Computer, 
uh, up in the Silicon Valley. Um, and, you know, it took a while and, and uh, a lot of hard work, but we raised seven million in venture capital and built a good company and sold it. Um, and, but, but nobody was ever going to say to him, we're just not going to back you as I knew it because of my venture capital experience. I knew what the message meant, but he was never going to understand. Yeah, it, it's a really big issue. And it, you know, investors are not incentivized to share that transparent feedback uh, for a number of reasons. And not all of them are, um, you know, bad natured. Um, and some of them are that you do want to keep up good relations and potentially invest later after exactly. they address some of those issues. Uh, but for entrepreneurs, it is it makes things very opaque and it can seem very misleading uh, and, and it is a big deal. Um, and so, you know, part of what we're doing with Scrubius is through our feedback to founders, providing that type of feedback and helping them understand what an investor might be thinking and the questions they're asking. Uh, and then something I didn't speak to, but we are building an investor portal to help them discover these opportunities that we help clarify. And one of the things we've built in is the ability to give anonymous feedback. Because I think a lot of investors would provide that candid feedback if it didn't come with the potential repercussions to, you know, with whatever next step with them or with their fund. Um, but it's really critical. It, it really is. So for entrepreneurs, if you're getting that type of answer from investors, if you're hearing it's too early or, you know, something more vague, uh, try to seek out friendlies, try to give your pitch to other friendly investors where you're not doing the real pitch or people who are familiar or veterans of the industry and see if they can help give you some insight there because you, re you really should know it. Um, and, and it is helpful to be aware that investors don't give it to you for a reason. I think uh, you probably said the main reason is that uh, investors might wanna come in lighter. So they, they, they don't wanna burn any bridges. Uh, so they're pretty careful what they say. Well, one of the things, again, uh, back to the, the fundable startup, uh, one of the strategies I think for uh, ditch techs is, and, and you said it early on, it talked about risk reduction, uh, but the more companies can uh, show that they have some market traction, uh, I think the more they can argue risk reduction. I mean, if, if you're really out there in the market and you have uh, customers and, and you're selling product, people are paying your price and giving you good feedback and coming back for more, uh, then the only real, I mean, you kind of demonstrated that the team can execute, the, then the only real risk is the risk of scaling the thing up. The, the closer, and some companies, uh, not all companies understand that, but, and not all companies can do that. I mean, not all companies have that option, but um, these days with uh, apps and uh, w websites and a lot of things that you can develop on a fairly low budget, uh, sometimes there is a potential to go out there and get significant amount of market traction uh, and raise uh, your funds off that. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is I think a lot of the time entrepreneurs can fall into the trap of thinking that getting your funding is the goal, but the goal of funding is to build a successful company, which is revenue. <laughs> it's not just to continually raise rounds. Uh, you know, there, there should be an exit and, within, and you need uh, customers, you need customer revenue to be able to do that. Um, and there are, you're right, a lot of ways that you can show traction. You know, if you're pre-product or pre-revenue, you can still get funded, but whatever you can do to prove that there is a willingness to adopt or a willingness to pay for your solution. And there are so many low code or no code tools that you can use, right? Even my own product, my first product was a Google Doc where I just outlined all my content and had founder work through it, no money, no nothing. And we got a founder into Mass Challenge off of, you know, working on a Google Doc and minimal, you know, uh, human help. <laughs> so the one step of validation, right? Then, you know, I would go to the next tech solution and the next one, uh, or you can build up waiting lists and, you know, you can run out market research surveys, not as good as actually having somebody give you a credit card or, you know, pay even something, even a small amount for something. Yeah. Um, but there's lots of ways that you can show traction. It doesn't have to be sales. 
you know, it, it's showing, it's indicating that willingness to pay and ability to sell. Well, and, and that's probably the best way to get around the problem. If your management team doesn't have a lot of uh, instant credibility, you know, if you don't have long resumes and long uh, stories of success, go out and prove that you can do it, you know, just, just get it done and uh, come back and say, well, look, this is what we said two years ago that we were going to do. We got it done. What else do you want? Yeah. Yeah. And it's all, it's all about that risk reduction, right? You're getting money. The investor is giving you money to help build your company. They're not giving you money because you have figured everything out already, then you wouldn't need their money. So. Yeah. <laughs> Allison, I, I, I like uh, your approach. I think you're really on the right track. You're doing a good job. Um, and and uh, so, so I, I have one question less. And it's a really dirty question. It's it's, okay. it's an uh, un, unfair question, but uh, I, I and I know you'll have a good answer. What do you say to the, the venture capitalist who says, "Well, the CEO I want to invest in is smart enough to build his own pitch deck"? Uh, so I'll give a faceted answer to that. Um, I. I actually really don't believe that you should pay someone else or another firm to make your pitch deck. I, I don't think that's a good use of money. Uh, and, and really regardless of stage, I, I hate to see people spending thousands of dollars on consultants or design firms to make a fundraising pitch deck. Uh, what I will say is that it's very difficult to tell your narrative in a way that is compelling to an investor who's a different mindset than, than you have. And when you are so in the weeds of your own thing, it is very difficult to separate and tell that story to a generalist audience. And there is absolutely no shame in getting help with that. Uh, and if you, you know, think of any other business, you know, tell, tell the VC, well, how many portfolio companies have you paid to have consultants come in to help them with a problem? Was that, should they have been able to figure out everything on their own in that company without any consultants? I don't think anybody would say no to that. It's a very successful industry uh, and it can do a lot of good. Well, it's the same if you're fundraising, you might need a little help fundraising. I still think the CEO should be the one who leads the creation of the deck. They're the one that has to present it and own it and feel extremely confident talking to everything in it. But you you should get some help getting your story in the right place. Uh, I, that's a good answer. I, 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 it's a very, uh, very fair answer. What, one of the things um, I, I like to do if I get involved with a company pretty early on is uh, start putting together a PowerPoint presentation uh, that's not intended to be an investor deck. It's intended to be the uh, an internal uh, strategic plan uh, or operating plan, but it addresses all the same issues, uh, but it addresses them from the point of view of, um, you know, we need to sit down periodically and have company meetings and go through these slides and make sure everybody's on the same page and uh, there are some things to debate and, and uh, some different approaches that have to be uh, selected. Uh, and then it, it's pretty easy to evolve that kind of a uh, deck into an investor deck, not trivial. Uh, but I think you make an excellent point to, to really sit down and put together a good uh, pitch deck uh, is a uh, a difficult exercise in writing, and and most most people, I mean, even great CEOs are not not necessarily uh, really good at uh, writing, putting things in words. No, if you think about technical industries or life science industries, that is not what they have been doing in their career. That is a different skill, right? If you wanted them to give you a grand rounds, no problem, they can do that. <laughs> Don't expect them to also be able to put together a five to 10 minute strategic overview, keeping the mind of an investor, uh, you know, in, in their communication without somebody helping them or teaching them how to do that. Uh, and I think any VC would say if they ran across a founder who said, I can do all of the things, I can do everything myself, that's not a very investable founder. <laughs> fair, fair enough. 
uh, Allison, how do you uh, wrap it up for me? What what uh, what are the important messages that uh, you would like people to hear? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I think the biggest one is just considering that risk reduction lens. It's not one that a lot of people use, but that's you know when you're thinking about the investor side, that is how they're approaching it. Like you said, you know fair or unfair it is from a more critical you know negative angle because they're they're trying to take risk away so help them take that risk away uh and then the other you know those header statements or headlines whatever you want to say it is don't label your don't just say problem solution don't do that T tell someone the point of the slide you own the narrative of your deck that way and you make it easy to understand what you're presenting investors don't have the time to try to elicit what it is you want them to know. Uh, so you'll have a stronger chance at getting those meetings and progressing if you just use some elements of how humans take in information when you design your deck. Uh, and then the last, you know, again, we didn't talk about the presentation part, but it is just as critical, uh, you know, and I, I firmly believe that we raised the money at my last company that we did in part because I am a strong, confident presenter and there are signals that you need to put out when you're in those investor meetings so that they believe you will be a good steward of their capital and you will be a good working partner. Uh, and you're able to have that confidence and, and ability. Uh, and it's non-trivial how you present. Uh, and it, it's, again, another skill. Not everyone is good or natural at it, but you can work at it just like you can work at making the written material. You can work on your presentation style as well. Great, good, good summary. You are a good presenter. I've enjoyed the conversation and I hope uh, uh, we'll provide you with a tool that, that will help you with some clients uh, down the road sometime. Uh, you've been listening to uh, the Pitch Tip Zoomcast. I'm your host, Fred Haney, and we usually have a CEO presenting his pitch deck and me, the experienced venture capitalist, uh, asking questions and giving feedback. But today we've been uh, talking with Allison Byers, who's the founder and CEO of Scrubius. Uh, and Allison's in the business of helping companies uh, pre prepare their pitch decks. And she's really on the right track uh, about how to go about it and how to do these things. I've, I've uh, enjoyed the conversation. I uh, think uh, you're really going about it in, in a good way. Um, audience, I hope you'll tune in to the next Pitch Tip Zoomcast. We do one of these every week or two. Uh, and uh, if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that. It's the Fundable Startup YouTube channel. Allison, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been uh, a joy talking to you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a fun conversation. Good luck.